We want to extend a huge welcome to all the virtual members of Columbine United Church. Those of us, those of you who join us from around the world and some of you over in Europe, especially our men and women in uniform, it is great to have you here. You are so much a part of our lives. You are a part of our community. But as always, I want you to do more than just like watch this video. I want you to think about someone in your life, in your family, who needs to hear this message. Send them the URL. Post the URL on your Facebook. Tell everybody this is who you are. This is what you believe because at Columbine United Church, we are changing the way think, people think about God. Let's give these people a huge round of applause. Good to have them all here. Our scripture passage this morning is one verse, just one verse. I oftentimes like to think about one verse, and I'll take one verse and just go with it for months at a time in my own devotional life to kind of allow its meaning to, to sink into me. And you might not think you know Psalm 46.10, but you do know Psalm 46.10, or you should know Psalm 46.10. Listen for God's word. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And here the reading ends, and may God bless these words now as I seek to apply them to our lives. So the uh, scripture passage, I mean the sermon is called Sick Day. Sick Day, Sick Day. Do you ever remember uh, faking being sick so you didn't have to go to school? You remember that? You know, I remember doing that. You know, like I had a big test coming up. I did not want to go to school. So, you know, I faked being sick. You know, I was laying there kind of groaning. My mom comes in, you know, and I don't want to go to school. Stephen, you know, she, oh my gosh, she comes up. She puts her hand on my forehead. And it's like, honey, you don't have a fever. I know, but I don't want to go to school. I have this big day. I don't want to go. And she said, Stephen, look it. It's your doctoral thesis. Get up, get out of bed. <laughs> You have to go defend it. Come on, you saw that coming, for God's sakes. That's an oldest joke in the world. But don't you remember the times like second grade? We had it down. My brother and I, we had this thing down to a science. Like if you didn't want to go to school, right, and you had to fake, fake you know, be in sex, you know, there are several things that, that we did. First of all, you go into the bathroom and you get the rubber, uh, you know, hot water thing. You fill that up thing with hot water and you put the, don't you remember those rubber plastic, you know, bladders? Some of the younger kids are going, what the? Anyways, you did what? And so we, uh, we took that and it was nice and hot and you kind of laid on it to try to get your heat up. And so then when she would come in, you know, she'd come in, I'm too sick. And she goes, oh, she could get the thermometer, right? We grew up with mercury. We grow up with mercury because, you know, kids today, they have no idea how easy it is, you know, because now the moms, they, they put the thing over, which makes it kind of hard to fake being sick, but they roll it over and there's a, th or they put it in the ear. I mean, in the day, it was mercury under your tongue, which is like, what was wrong with us back then? Here, kid, have some mercury. Uh, <laughs> Hold it, on, hold it under your tongue, you know, and, and now you keep it right there because I'm going to be back in five minutes. And so she'd go out, boom, that's your opportunity. You get that thing, you put it under your arm, you know, you rub it, you hold it to the light, you take that red, red you know, hot water thing and you put the thermometer on there and you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait. And she comes back in, she's coming down the hallway, in your mouth. She comes in, she takes that and says, wow, 116 degrees. <laughs> Wow, wow. She'd shake that thing down for the mark. Maybe either, this, either you're dead or this thing is broken. Why don't you roll over so we can do it the other way? <laughs> Remember those days? You know, I tell my kids about that and they go, oh, Grandma did not do that. <laughs> Isn't that illegal? They can't really do You're not going to do that to us, are you? Kids today, they have no idea what it's like in the pioneer days. They have no idea. No idea. So when was the last time that you as an adult fake work or fake work so you could go sit? <laughs> you could you faked sick so you didn't have to go to work. You know, tell your wife, honey, I'm sick, I can't go to work. You're faking it. You know what's really interesting is that um, talk with some medical doctors. 
And there is a disorder, I'm, I'm going to kind of butcher the name, it's called Munchausen disease. Dr. Foster, did I get that right? Munchausen degrees, uh, disorder. And it's where people not just fake sick, but they, they eat glass, they do all kinds of crazy things to force fevers. So they get to go into the ER and get taken care of because that's the only way that they can find intimacy and find care and compassion. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very sad disorder. But the rest of us, we hate being sick. I never fake being sick. I hate being sick. I hate being sick. Don't you hate being sick? You know, and, and here's the crazy thing, though, is that uh, the average American is sick three times a year. Three times a year. And boy, have I lived up to that this year. Now, I know that some of you are going, sitting there going, I haven't been sick in 10 years. Well, you all just shut up. Just be quiet, because you'll ruin the sermon. Just because you know, like I, I have been sick. I had the flu in January. I had the flu in January. I had pneumonia in uh, right there in the beginning of April, Easter Sunday. I was had laryngitis for six weeks. The pneumonia has screwed up my lungs up one side and down the other, so much so that that I'm still wrestling with the effects of it. Sometimes walking feels like climbing a 14er. They gave me a steroid couple weeks ago that destroyed my vocal cords. Um, all this past week I was, um, had laryngitis again. Had laryngitis again yesterday and I thought, I just kind of came out of the blue and the, and the doctor said, sorry the steroid is going to affect your vocal cords for somewhere between two days and two weeks and I woke up this morning with the voice, oh thank God, thank goodness that you don't have a voice. You know and, and it, we're sick so much and if you think about this so many of you have kids, okay? So let's go with the average family of four, mom and dad, two kids. That means that sickness is in, your, is in your house at least once a month. At least once a month. And you got a little kid, and now they're finally back at school, right? And now they're catching literally every single thing that is going around the school, and they bring it home, and you're, you know, my gosh, sometimes as parents of kids, you're more sick than kids are sick. And that's why, you know, for me, I wanted to include this in our summer series, Jesus in Blue Jeans, where we're trying to apply our faith to our everyday aspect of our lives. And sometimes we think about the big and hopeful aspect of our lives, but I've realized that the sickness is such a huge part of our life that we have to figure out a way to really apply it to who we are. And that's why I want to dive in today to that, because, you know, um, isn't that a great picture? Um, Our lives... And I'm looking around like Todd Strickland is a chaplain down at which hospital downtown? University. University Hospital. Dr. Mark Foster is a physician. We have other physicians and nurses. Why don't you guys put your hands up? Physicians and nurses over here, right there. So we spend the most of our lives with people who are very, very ill. And you know, we don't think anything about gowning up and, and working with people who have MRSA. Uh, we work with people who have had strokes and illnesses, and, and I believe that means that we are people that are most blessed. We are, are pe- I am so blessed because I get to work w- with some of these people. You know, uh, about, uh, every, every, about once a month, maybe a little bit more, I, I get to work with Jeff Ferris. Uh, Jeff Ferris is one, um, he is this big, huge entrepreneur. He was this big, huge, still is. We've got this brain that doesn't stop and had a massive stroke. It's MS. And now he's confined to a wheelchair. Can't use his left arm. And, and when I see him, I, he inspires me. He inspires me in life. He's one of my greatest teachers. Uh, we have a, a, a church member who's currently dying. Um, young woman who uh, we saw, I saw her in Littleton Porter Hospital um, a year ago, May, and it's like, wow, what are you doing here? Um, we just happened to pass in, in, the, um, in the kind of the narth- narthex, the waiting room of Littleton. She said, well, kind of dealing with some dizziness. The diz- dizziness became a legion on her brain. I gave her last rites at that Christmas when she was on life support systems. She recovered. She was great. This is Joanne York, comes to the 8 o'clock service. And then uh, she got her hair grew back. Talk about someone who's full of life. She's 58, 59. And then returned. Bam. 
and then a week ago, it's like she fell off the health cliff. And I just talked with her, uh, Ron, her boyfriend, at the 8 o'clock service, and we thought she was going to die last week, and she's just doing this. Our own Kathy Berenberg. Kathy, who, who stood up here and sang for years and years and years and years, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. My age, 56. She's in hospice. We're waiting for her to. And I believe that these people teach us the most profound lessons in life. So much so that I believe that that's why we are the most blessed to work with these people. And what I would like to do today is to share with you just a few of the lessons that, that I believe that these people teach me, that hopefully the next time you find yourself sick or ill, Dr. Mulvaney back there also works with, with ill people. You know, for me, the, the phrase that these people have taught me is, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And I want to take just this one phrase, and I want to parse it out for us to think about. Let's think about the first phrase, be still. Be still. One of the powerful things about illness does is, well, it's supposed to teach us about how to be still. Because usually when we're sick, we're still. At least some of us are. I mean, you know, I, I am preaching to myself. I am so bad at this being still thing. I can't see straight. You know, like right now, I'm supposed to have a chair right here behind me because I'm supposed to learn how to preach sitting down. And I can't, you know, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't sit down. It's where my brains are. That's what my wife says. That's where, and I suffocate. That's where I suffocate. But, you know, I'm, I'm hard, you know, you know how I got sick? You know how I got sick? I got sick. Because on Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday, I, I had this terrible flu that was rebuilding, rebuilding. And, and Justin said, you know, Steve, you should really stay, stay home. God, J Steve, you should really stay home. I can't. I'm the senior pastor of Columbine United Church. I have not missed an Easter Sunday. Justin said, look it, I have sunrise service. Stay. I have not missed a sunrise service in 33. And I got up and said, okay, I'm staying home. But I'm not missing Sunday. They can't do without me. I could have Maybe, probably have done permanent damage to my vocal cords. Because I don't know how to be still. Norman Cousins, in his uh, marvelous book, Anatomy of an Illness, uh, talks about with that when he, um, uh, he was so busy as an author, as a public speaker, as a, as a doctor, and he was talking about illness, and, and he got to the point where he was exhausted. And he went to his secretary and he said, I, can I take a break? Is there any way I can take a break? And she said, Dr. Cousins, you are booked for the next several weeks. You're supposed to be in a conference in such, such a city in three days. It would take like a catastrophic something, you know, to stop you from, from having to go. It was like the next day that he had a massive heart attack. He had a massive heart attack. And guess what? The thing was canceled. The next several things were canceled. He, he was forced to be still. Why is it so hard for us in our culture to be still? You know, every single one of us, you know, if I asked you, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Oh, I believe in the Ten Commandments. Well, what about that one that says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy? When was the last time you honored the Sabbath and kept it holy? Today is your Sabbath. How are you keeping it holy? You know, back in the day, they stoned you if you didn't honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, which I always thought would be a great way to increase attendance at church. <laughs> Stoning. Stoning. That would be, that's right. Hey, in Colorado, we could put a whole new bend on that. <laughs> 
I never thought about that. I never thought about that. There is a sermon in there. I'm not going to go there today, however. You know, every Sunday I try to teach you something from the world religions. This is from the Hindu holy book, the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna, who is the Christ presence in Hinduism. Now, Krishna was fully human and fully divine. And you could also say that Krishna is the, that Jesus is the Krishna presence within Christianity, both the same personas. Krishna says, still your mind in me. Still yourself in me. And without a doubt, you shall be united with me, Lord of love, dwelling in your heart. And it's in that stillness that we find God. It's when we are quiet that we find God. How are you quiet? Be still and know. Be still and know. The Hebrew word for no is not an intellectual sense. The Hebrew word for no is this thing that is inside and out, top and bottom. It's this complete whole being, this whole sense of knowing who you are in, in life and who you are in the world. I think what happens is that when you are sick, it invites you, i.e. slash challenges you, to really think about what do you know about your life. What do you know about what is important, about what is not important in your life? Because you know what? When you're sick, when you are really sick, when you are, I think I'm going to die sick, and you have to call and you have to be home, or someone you love and you're taking care of them, or they're in their, on their deathbed in the hospital, you know what? What you begin to realize? All that stuff you have in your garage means nothing. All the stuff you have in your closet means nothing. In fact, what being sick and being with people, the blessing about being with people who are really sick is that they remind us about our priorities, the things that we just so take for granted. I love this next quote. The things you take for granted, someone else is praying for. Kelly Hardison, a, a young woman in our church, 26, 27, earlier in the late spring, early summer, had a massive stroke. She was in Littleton Porter Hospital and mom and two little kids. And we would go visit. And uh, one time I went to see Kelly and she was kind of uh, bright that day. Kelly, how are you? I got to go outside for the first time today. And her left side of her face is paralyzed. I got to go outside for the first time today and felt a breeze. I felt a breeze. I went, <clears throat> and I was just complaining about the cold spring we were having. <laughs> Heather Becky, uh, Heather Becky, another young woman in the church, kind of early 30s, uh, had a massive, uh, strange form of leukemia. Uh, she wasn't feeling good. Her husband noticed she wasn't feeling good. They needed, thought maybe she had, you know, some iron deficiency. They went to the doctor. No, they found that she had a very, very rare form of leukemia. Like that night, the next day, they put her down to Presbyterian St. Luke's, and they just started blasting her with chemotherapy. I'll never forget uh, blisters, chemo blisters, filled her mouth. If you've ever seen, you want to see, you want to see pain? You want to see suffering? See someone with chemo blisters all throughout their mouth. I remember thinking, you complain about flossing. Well, she lost all of her hair, beautiful long blonde hair. It's like, wow, I bitch when the, you know, the lady cuts my hair too short. You know, the, all of the, the things we take for granted are really funny. This is kind of a fun, fun, funny one. I forgot to say at the 8 o'clock, Richard Lynn is, has now since passed away. Richard Lynn is one of my favorite crotchety old guys in, in the church who, 
had his prostate removed. He had two hip surgeries, two knee replacements, heart surgery. His wife was hospitalized for Alzheimer's. And when he, I just loved him because the older he got, the crotcheter he got, he used to say, the golden years suck. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, and when he'd be in the hospital and when he, had, when he felt as though I hadn't been up to the hospital earlier enough to visit him, he'd call the secretary, tell Junior to get his <laughs> up to see me. And, uh, and Dot would come and say, your afternoon's been canceled. You've got to go see Richard. So I, I'd go see him. And I'll never forget in his, his uh, last couple of weeks, he said, he said, Junior, which, by the way, he's the only one who gets to call me that. Uh, <laughs> Junior, which do you think I miss most, driving or sex? <laughs> now, this is not a, a test you want to get wrong, right? <laughs> You want to make sure you answer this right. And I said, driving, you're right. Because I wasn't going to go to the other one. <laughs> you know, Richard loved to drive. He had a Datsun 240Z, 260Z, 280Z. He had all the latest sports cars. You know, he was a physician who answered to the Surgeon General. He was way up there. And he said, you know what I miss? I miss, I miss the freedom to go where I want to go. Because you know where I get to go? To my nursing home room. Do you know what I have to wear? Depends. Do you know what I have to wear? A catheter. And it's like, we, we forget the, the beautiful aspect of life. And when we, when we are with someone and, and they've died, and we've literally have been there, and we, and we walk outside, I walk outside, and I always go, man, the, the grass is so green. How did I miss this? And I look at the sky, the sky is so blue. How, how did I miss this? Be still and know. Be still and know I am God. I think one of the most profound things about being sick and being ill, either yourself or someone that you love, is that it forces you to think about your relationship with God. It forces you to think about your relationship with God. You know, when something tragic has happened to you or someone you love, you, it's very hard not to ask, how can a good, loving, all-powerful God allow this to happen to me? And we often wrestle and sit with them and say, you know, that it really isn't that God allowed this, it's that, that God only allowed this and that we live in this kind of world. We live in this kind of world where things happen. But what it means for having an all-loving, all-powerful God is that God is really saying that there's nothing that's going to happen to you that will be beyond my ability to love you and care for you. Which is so powerful because... At some point, each of us are going to have to trust the hands of God. Each of us are going to have to trust the hands of God. Mr. Samuel, I need you at the keyboard. And, you know, and, and in that, um, that moment, when we have to say for either ourselves or, or someone we love, I commit my spirit into your hands. The phrase that Jesus used at his death, we have to ask ourselves, is it well with my soul? You know, uh, when, it, when Barry was singing it the second time, it hit me and I, I asked Justin, I said, hey, hey, what's the name of the guy who wrote this song? Horatio Spafford. So where this song came from 
is that uh, it was back in the 1800s and he and his wife and four kids were going to Europe and the United States to start a new life, to start a business. He was an entrepreneur and he decided to stay back and so he, he sent his, his uh, wife and daughters ahead of them. And when they were halfway across the Atlantic, a storm came in and the ship sank. His wife survived, but his four daughters were killed. So he got in the boat. He got in another boat and crossed the Atlantic. And when he was in the place where his daughters died, he thought about the presence of God and the presence of God in his own life. And, and he wrote this song, It is well, it is well with my soul. Now here's the profound thing is that um, he and his wife went on to have three other kids. And, and his uh, youngest son died of a disease. Well, his Christian church saw it as a punishment from God and expelled them from the congregation. Spafford said, it is well with my soul. And he and his wife started a church called the Overcomers. I love that. Because I'll tell you what, the people, the Jeff Ferris's, the Heather Beckys, and on and on, the Kathy Berenbergs of this church, whew, they teach us what it means to overcome. They teach us what it is to face the most challenging, difficult obstacles in our life and to know that God is with us and we will overcome. Let's pray. God, you uh, move us. We look into the eyes of those who are dying and we see life. We see wisdom. We see gratefulness and thankfulness. We remember the simple things of life that we each have, the breeze, the sunshine, the smile and laughter of a child. God, remind us that you are here, that you show up over and over and over again, that you've made a beautiful, world full of goodness and wonder and mystery. That you've made our lives full of goodness, wonder, and mystery. And that we have these lives to offer to others. Remind us that it is these lives that bring heaven to earth. We lift up now that prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.